Well, happy Saturday uh, to afternoon to everybody. We appreciate your being here uh, for this presentation on the uh, architecture and decoration of the El Paso Public Library building. It really is an extraordinary building. And a lot of times we pass by things when we've lived with them a long time or if we're new to town, we're not really aware of what we're looking at. And the great thing about Tom Lee, he's embedded in so many places that he takes us different places. And once you get there, you can learn a lot more, like the architects and the, the designers that designed uh, a lot of this building. Uh, but we'll start with Tom Lee, uh, who did a couple of the designs on the, um, on the, uh, the building. I would like to thank Bill Palmore, who is here, whom you'll meet next, who is from the, he's from El Paso, he has roots in El Paso, he's always been interested in modern architecture in El Paso. He'll tell you more about what he's done, what his, his publications, his exhibitions, what he's, he's had his students do. But we're always happy to have a native uh, to come home and share his knowledge that he's also been sharing in New York with us here at home. And then we have Melissa Otis, who's new to the Tom Lee Institute, and she has recently founded this Trost Society because she's someone who, like me, has tr who studied abroad. And, um, but unlike me at the beginning, it took me a while to warm up and, and realize how many treasures we had in our own community to share our own cultural heritage with the rest of the world. But she set the ground running. Uh, and you'll be hearing from her today on, um, on, on, on this library building. Her specialty in studying was in ornamentation. So she'll share some of that knowledge, but applying it to uh, this structure. But what I wanted to do just uh, briefly at the beginning was to talk about Tom Lee's involvement uh, with the El Paso Public Library when it was built. Uh, in, when was the actual structure completed, Bill? 1954. His, his painting uh, was done years later in 1957, uh, but 1954 is when the building was done. There's a beautiful publication that I, I, I think you'll be hearing uh, more about it that was done uh, when this library was built. And the owl, you recognize the owl that's on the front of the publication? Where else is it? The on the front of the building. So Tom Lee's uh, friend, Louis Doble, and Louis Doble's son, Mike Doble, is in the audience. If you'll hold your hand up, Mike, uh, got his friend, Tom Lee, and other artists whom you'll hear from to help with the design and decoration of this building. And one of the decorations was this owl that's on uh, the front of the building. And it's on the front of the publication on the library. And the quote beneath it says, I go to book and to, I go to books and to nature as a bee goes to the flower for a nectar that I can make into my own honey by John Burroughs. Of course, it's an owl uh, with a nopal. Uh, the decoration you'll, you'll see in this place is very much about our region. And I want to know what the flower is, which I'm not certain if that's a nopal flower. I watch, I watch bees on our cacti at my house all the time. Uh, and then the tree that the owl would have uh, been on would be a specific tree. Does anyone know what it would be? Like what? The mountain leaves, laurel? Leaves look a little like mountain laurel. Like mountain laurel? Tom Lee was so specific, he wouldn't just kind of say some kind of tree. He would know the kind of tree where an owl would roost and use that tree. Um, so the, here, here is the owl, but it is such a beautiful design. Of course, Tom Lee had done uh, uh, all kinds of uh, logos he, for, for different organizations. He'd done a lot of design work in Chicago and other places. So this wasn't a new thing for him. He did it all. But this is the structure, and I, I, uh, when you first came in, this is where you would come in the front door. You all may be showing this again. But as you walked in the front today, of course they changed the front. When Carol Cassiano Bray was here and we built the History Museum, they changed the front from Oregon Street to face the park so that the park would join the History Museum and the library. 
but the current librarian has changed it back to the old front. And this is something that's kind of interesting to learn about things like this. Because when you walked, when you used to walk in to the library, past the desk, the first thing you would see would be the Southwest Reading Room, uh, which puts you in place of where you are in the Southwest and the books around the theme where you are. Um, the mural was there, uh, and, 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 um, uh, but it's been moved. It's down out at the front of the back. It's now the back entrance rather than the front entrance. Um, and I show this to you because I, I, it gives us a lot of food for thought, I think. But Louis Doble had asked Tom Lee, he left a wall for him to paint a mural. And uh, he, had not, uh, he had not painted a mural since 1940, the 1940s. He completed this one in 1957. And I'm going to read to you from his book, which is out of uh, print, the, a picture gallery. But he wrote, when the citizens of El Paso voted a municipal bond issue to build a new public library, I offered to paint a mural in the new building as a gift to my town. It was a gift from Tom. A fine space for a mural was incorporated into the building's design, and a wall opposite the main entrance on the ground floor was surfaced, was surfaced and prepared and prepared according to my own specifications, ready for the painting I promised to provide. It took me a while to deliver. I was working on the King Ranch volumes. He was a painter as well as a novelist, and at this time, in 1957, he was working on the King Ranch volumes, wearing out typewriting, typewriter ribbons instead of squeezing paint tubes. The wall stood blank and glaring white for two years after the new building's doors were open. Occasionally, I would walk into the library, take a long look, and invite my mind to dwell upon that pristine wall and what it might say someday when my paint box was opened again. The postponements with their ruminations were of ultimate benefit. When at last I could devote myself to the actual work, the mural's design, its scale, its color, its content, everything about it seemed ready and waiting to write, upon it, uh, write itself forthrightly upon the wall. I wanted to stop there because he talks about his ruminations over two years. But of course, his ruminations extended far, far back uh, from two years prior to 1957. And I wanted to just give you a glimpse of what would have gone into the realization of this mural. Tom Lee had grown up in El Paso. He'd gone to the Art Institute. And right after the Art Institute, actually as a child here, he would take the train up to Santa Fe and was always interested in indigenous cultures. He worked, he worked in the laboratory of anthropology doing designs, indigenous designs. And I remember him telling me one time, he said, why that's what the Indians were looking at in their pottery designs. Are there any other shadows and the clouds and the things that they would see in nature? Just as a statement, uh, I look to nature and to books. In 1936, his first wife died. He married a fellow Art Institute student who died in El Paso in 1936, the same year his mother and grandmother died. But this was a painting that he did from a drawing called Juarez. But it became, and it was from looking out at the colonias of Juarez at the time, but the painting ended up being called Lonely Town. And in it, a lone woman with dry twigs on her back is walking away. He, he would have remarried and married a woman named Sarah Dighton who came out to El Paso from Monticello, Illinois and done this portrait in their apartment on the corner of Stanton Street and Rim Road on a, 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 a lit uh, a, a windowsill with her against that mountain. And Becky Reese has talked about this. I think it's very evident in the tone of her dress and her look that she's a mountain too. He always liked Carl Sandburg's uh, quote that a mountain's something that's fastened down, it's something you can count on. She was the same way. He would have completed 
many murals. This is one I'm showing. Uh, this was done in 1938, our Pass of the North mural in the federal courthouse. But I want you to notice the landscape and the way that mountain comes up over that doorway, the way that the horizontal fall of the rain in the distance uh, and the heroes of El Paso history in the foreground. With the Juarez Mountains, isn't it very evident? Those are the Juarez Mountains to the left. So he would have completed this mural as well as 11 others before doing this one. He would have in 1940s, before becoming a World War II war artist, he wanted to do a series of paintings. He longed to do a series of paintings coming out of the Southwest with accurately dressed figures in them. Uh, this is one called Sun, Wind, and Horizon without figures, which is unusual for Tom. He always liked to contemplate man's place in a vast and wondrous world, and man is generally very, very small. In that notebook, it was for a Rosenwald Fellowship, which he ended up turning down so that he could go to World War II and become a war correspondent, but he always loved J. Frank Doby's quote that was included about growing out of the Southwest's own soil, burned by its own suns, sifted by its own winds, given perspective by its own spaces, and humanized and dramatized in the personalities that made up its own people, the Southwest, which was his home. You recognize this, this painting hung in the Oval Office for eight years. It's called Rio Grande. It's in the collection of the El Paso Museum of Art. This was done in 1956. Do you remember when I told you the notebook was done? When he he'd wanted to do that series of paintings, that was 1940. So 26 years later, thinking about sun, earth, wind, and sky, those elements, he did this painting. Uh, that ended up in the Oval Office of the White House. So, these are his words uh, about what he ended up painting. It took its shape simply as a luminous window looking out upon its birthland. It spoke of space, sun, cloud, rain, wind, mountain, mesa, rock, sand, soil, and of living growth nurtured by them. The only human habitant of this elemental landscape was the viewer of the mural. The landscape's horizon was at the viewer's eye level when standing on the library's floor. It was the earth inhabited only by the viewer's mind. The painting was begun in April of 1956 and finished in May. Throughout the work at the library, I had a devoted associate and a competent assistant as a muralist. Sarah helped both in drawing the design on the wall and in the final painting. If you look at it, they're both signed. We shared it, both of us signed it. We take joint satisfaction in it and the shelves close by our mural hold the library's good collection of reference material relating to Paso del Norte and the Southwest. And that's what it would have looked like. In the Southwest reading room, which when we remodeled the library was taken away. And I think at the time, what happens, I, Carol Bray, she came to see me. Everyone really thought very highly of Carol Bray, and I did too. She came to Tom Lee to see if they might use the colors of this mural in the building, which they did. They chose the pigments based on a palette that he actually gave them. But in the press for more space, and reorganizing the library in a way so that it could face out on to our new front. Uh, this was taken away. And uh, I think you can see what a loss it is. And often, I think Carol probably didn't even know this existed. You know, the book had been out of print for so long. And this little publication, when you're in a library, there's so many thousands of materials 
But it's just so often we move so quickly to do things when if you read and understood what went into it, and the people who built this structure, so much went into it, it would give you pause as you move ahead. So it's a no blame of anyone. I want to commend the, the library during Tom Lee month. They, they shared the photographs of what it looked like and uh, to help us remember the Southwest Room. And many times things like this end up being brought back when you realize what you lost as far as your heritage. But the perfect frame around it. And there's the painting in color uh, that you'll uh, see outside. The, uh, the, the drawing, I want you all to know this, the, 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 the to scale painting, Tom Lee did a to scale uh, painting where one inch equaled one foot and it belonged to the Doble family. And a while back, we placed, there was a group of El Pasoans who helped contribute to buying it for the Smithsonian American Art Museum uh, where it is now housed as part of their mural collection of studies for U.S. murals. So, thank you very much. I'll turn it over now uh, to Bill, who would talk a little bit more about this structure. I have a list of people that I was planning to thank, and the amusing thing is that most of them are sitting here <laughs> and make up the bulk of the audience. So I will spare, uh, I'll skip ahead a lot of that. Um, thank you, obviously, Adair, for allowing me to continually indulge this idea of mine. And uh, uh, Claudia, thank you very much for helping out. And Mark, thank you for your whole staff. Arturo and uh, Marta are uh, amazing. And I've had a lot of people help me out on this that are, are not here. Uh, Waterhouse's son was very helpful. And um, the Doble family, Mike and his mom, uh, met with me. And so we covered a lot of ground that way. And uh, it's a lot of stuff to talk about. And we're only 12 and 14 people. So um, I will sort of uh, cruise through the material uh, without um, too much uh, anxiety. Everybody knows who I am, I presume, by this point. Um, I grew up here. I live in New York City. I'm an architect, and I'm a professor. And uh, the architecture of the city is my passion. And uh, this is about the, this is the fourth lecture I've given in El Paso on various subjects. and. Uh, I've given similar shows in Dallas, New York City, and Albuquerque. So what I always say is that uh, this, our work, our legacy here is very interesting to other people. They are very surprised that this strange little forgotten city uh, produces this sort of thing. And uh, so it's my job uh, to keep that moving. Uh, this building, uh, let's see, there we go. I'm gonna, Robert Thorpe is sitting, right, that childhood friend of mine is that man right behind uh, Mike Goble. Okay, his dad is an architect. And when I, some, it could be as much as 45 years ago, I put something like that. When I was thinking I wanted to be an architect, I asked his dad who, who had done, the, what was the best building in the city? And he said, it's the library, just without thinking about it. And uh, it took me uh, a long time to figure that out, that um, he was probably right. And uh, along the way, when I was working on uh, materials for the Garland and Hillis stuff, uh, I happened to have the pleasure of calling Julius Shulman, who was still alive at the time. Julius Shulman is one of the two most famous chroniclers of modernism. And I got him on the phone. I, was, I, I called information in Los Angeles, asked for him. They gave him the, his phone number. This old man answers the telephone, and it's him. Okay, and I say, I'm from El Paso and blah, blah, blah. The first thing that comes out of his mouth is, how about that library? <laughs> so 40 years later, he remembered this building. And uh, this incredible photograph is uh, 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 by him. Now, there are many things to say about this building. And I have to kind of jump ahead, because I realize that anyone looking at this might think that we're talking about a very comprehensive package that included the interior and the exterior, and that's a little bit compromising. So what, what I think the, the quality of the building for, for posterity, for the ages, is the proportion, the, the, the appearance and the, uh, the way that it just sits there is absolutely amazing. Uh, my students and I made that model, and I schlepped it down here, and it's actually sitting on a um, pedestal out there. So we got to know this thing uh, very intimately because we were short of working drawings and had to uh, 
fished through a lot of various materials, which got me in touch with uh, some very uh, good things. Now, I don't know that anyone would contradict me in saying that this is not a beautiful building, but we've got to talk about a few of the aspects of it that are uh, remarkable. To me, I don't like windows in buildings. I think aluminum windows or mirror glass windows are not what make a building beautiful. And what wonderful thing that they decided to do was to minimize the uh, fenestration. So this comes off as this massive, mass and void composition, which is exactly why it's so pretty. And the win windows are very discreet, very um, strategic. The materials couldn't be more interesting. The, uh, the, that lovely stone is Cordoba shell limestone from Austin. And I guess that's regional enough. It's only about, what, 600 miles east of here. But it's in, from Texas, so that's a good thing. And then famously, the, uh, the, uh, the columns are the, our are, are, uh, favorite material here, the uh, limestone from Mount Franklin. Okay, um, the charming, they made a, uh, which you have to go see it in the, uh, in the uh, special collections. They made a brochure to introduce the building, and they wrote things in it that uh, I thought at a glance, well, I, I, didn't, I wasn't impressed with it until I started thinking about it. And I don't know who wrote it, it could be Mr. Noble, but um, they, uh, they cited that this building was an example of modern Southwesternism. Okay, which how, how much closer could it be to that? And then very interestingly, inclusive of various cultures. Okay, so I think they designed the building. The, the building evolved, okay, but they knew along the way that they were gonna use the, uh, the petroglyphs, they were gonna use the uh, motifs of, of um, the region, they were gonna make it look a little bit like a Pueblo, and they were gonna use uh, local artists to, uh, to uh, work on it. So, very good looking building. And uh, what's remarkable about it also is that it largely, they have changed this building because of use, utility reasons, but the building is in great shape. So, it, and our climate takes care of these buildings. But, um, you know, this is, the build, this is a photograph from probably 1955, and you can go out and get a photograph of that uh, that's exactly like that. Okay, everyone in this room knows why that ceiling is famous, so we don't need to linger just yet about that. Melissa's gonna tell us more about it. But, um, of course, that's our portal. That's what they called it. The, we'll talk about this later. These are Waterhouse, who is one of the three characters that, uh, that produced this building. Um, these are his drawings, and all of those drawings in those cases are, are by him. And these are from his sketchbooks, thanks to the special collections at Utah. Bill, okay. today, I, I, today they we're having a session out at Waco Tanks, where yeah. they were interpreting all the designs from Waco Tanks. Wow. wow. We were just talking about, are you going to talk about the, them being a library, prehistoric library? Then cool. She's, still, she's on top of Good. that. Okay, I didn't realize until, it's funny how you find out things, but I finally, somebody said, well, you know that this building was published in 1960. And I thought, well, really? Or at 61. And this was cited in 1961 as one of the few buildings of merit designed in the state of Texas between 1950 and 1960. So it, it, it was famous, it was very well known, and I think in, a, in an odd way we've sort of, it's passed out of our conscience. It did out of my conscience, frankly, and uh, now it's uh, back clearly in my uh, photograph. Okay, so this gives you a sense of the, uh, uh, the massing, the proportions, why that is not a modernist building. This, uh, a modernist building uh, would be probably less sculpted, less figural, this gives you an idea of the, uh, uh, this also, the folks that know about Waterhouse, this gives you a pretty good idea of his hand present in the way that the parts are composed. He's an extraordinary composer of uh, building mass. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, the building all over, in many places that you would be surprised by, uh, there are features of, of very special detailing. The, this is oak molding around the windows in the front that features this abstract indigenous uh, design. And that drawing, is that drawing out there? I think it might be. Okay, this is Waterhouse's own drawing of that very same uh, design. And I have to say this now, if, I'm not, if I don't, if, but I'm gonna say it again, certainly, is that it's an extraordinary thing to go to an archive, your archive, the, the El Paso archive, and open a folder and find literally hundreds of drawings that, that document the progress of the thinking. It's incredible. And so Waterhouse's archive has gone to UTEP. Those are wonderful things in there. 
Lots of his drawings are here in the in the uh, Dobel and uh, Carolyn Dobel folio. Okay, so let's see. Um, we know this, but I, I I think we know this. Uh, this was the this Carnegie. No, it's not. What's this called? What's this square called? Cleveland, Cleveland Square. Okay, that uh, the dotted line zone back there is where the original Carnegie Library was that uh, this replaced. And this is kind of an interesting drawing because. It suggests that for a little while, they were contemplating keeping that building, and of course they should have. And the landscape design, when you look at uh, that zone, right? Oh, oh dear. Okay. Okay, this, this part right here, this is rather uh, for us architect types. That's where the mural is. Okay, that's where the southwest room would be right there. And where the mural is stretched is right in, in that zone. And it seems that at some point they contemplated opening the back. And there's in the, that brochure that I'm referring to, they talked about uh, having an outdoor reading area. So it's very interesting that, you, you know, that he held off for two years in painting that mural. And you, it makes you wonder if there wasn't a slight anxiety that that wasn't the right thing to do. In other words, come, come out the back of the building. And if they had done that, the unification between the old building and the new building obviously would have been very, very easy to do. So. Uh, we looked at the plans a, a little bit. Uh, very, uh, how do I say it? Uh, very prosaic. This building does not have dramatic interior spaces. And that's <clears throat> a fault, I would say. And I don't think it's the architect's fault necessarily. I think the librarians at the time, the idea at the time is that a, a building was very um, useful. In other words, these very large flat slabs of space where you store the books was a, was a good idea. Are you watching my time? Yeah, okay. I'm sure Okay, I'm good. Okay, so uh, enter here. This, is, this drawing doesn't show uh, the notes, the, the titles that somebody gave to the building, the other drawings. I should have pulled those. This beautiful zone, of course, is the porch. It was called a portal, which, and written in uh, Waterhouse's hand. Okay, and so we're thinking that when I think of portal, I think of the portal in Santa Fe. All such regional uh, Spanish settlements had these government buildings with portals in front of them. And I don't know uh, what the plan was. I was, never saw that used in, in a classic way. Perhaps it has been used that way in terms of uh, uh, festivals and sales and such. Obviously, enter here. Uh, this is Library 101. Every library in the world sort of looks like that. Of some interest is the fact that there's this dedicated zone to the right for the children, okay? And it has its own special entrance and all that stuff. And uh, this represents theoretically, I guess that's the right way to put it, the sort of, uh, this kind of spiritual leader of this entire project was a woman named Maud Sullivan. And she famously uh, pushed education in this city when there wasn't education in the city and uh, made the library a place where kids would like to go. And uh, she insisted that the building would, would um, do that. Okay, and off to the side is a uh, rather nice little auditorium. So it is, it's basically, and it's organized in a kind of interestingly in three different zones that um, will, will produce ultimately the, the form and the shape of the building. The uh, apologies to Mark, the second floor, this is where he is, the second floor could not be more prosaic. It is very simply an office building with a couple of larger spaces. So this is what I'm getting to when I say that the, this, can't, this building suffers for the lack of an interior uh, space that, that, that is worthy of the outside. Okay, um, catalog, um, let's see, cataloging goes there, meeting rooms. They hid the uh, air conditioning, when I, which I think is kind of fantastic. Um, all of that stuff is exactly what you would expect. Uh, of some interest, and I didn't know it at all, is that there are two floors down below the uh, ground floor. And uh, those were, there's two theories out there, that they had to build a bomb shelter as part of this building. <laughs> I wonder if that's true. Possible. Okay, because he, Arturo says that, uh, or, or Jack, no, Jack took me down there and said that they still have ration, rationing stuff down there. So there's, there's some probable truth to that idea. Okay, there are two massive slabs underneath this very interesting floor that we are used to. These uh, photographs are come right out of that brochure and are not satisfactory, but they're the only ones that I could come by. That gives you an idea of what um, the thing was like. You can almost smell it. Institutional 1950s. <laughs> Oak cabinets, books, you know, there it was. And uh, they did use modern furniture and such. 
This is a period photograph of that, uh, that southwestern room that we're talking about. This is where the mural would be. The, the a weighted mural would, would go right there. And the furniture, this is described as a room that celebrates the southwest, but done in a modernist style. Okay, so the furniture is modern. The, the, this is the only part of the building that features these uh, um, knoll type um, kidney shaped tables and such. That's the mural, we just talked about that. Um, terrible photograph again. There were woodworks and uh, craft um, enterprises imagined for the building. So the, the pecan table, I guess Melissa will talk about that. Uh, these elements here are uh, um, Cisneros, yeah. Okay, and in the current building, you can see that same, which is kind of interesting. I, I just kind of stumbled, this is that table. Okay, very anonymously placed just in the middle of nowhere. Okay, but you can still sit at that, which gives it some significance to me. And then this screen is one of two that um, was part of the, uh, uh, the, the the division that would keep that room private. These are rather beautiful. It's actually. original, the, the grill. Yeah, the that, they say that. Sample. Yeah, and uh, I thought I had a good picture of it. Yeah. There's a little um, detail. Yeah, okay, that over there is a very, very modernist uh, steel, iron, I think it must be iron, with these nice art glass panels and that's still alive, and that uh, occurs right in there. So they had they spent a lot of time on that room, and I think that they did not get very far with uh, other ideas that they might have had on the interior. Uh, Melissa will talk about these. Again, Waterhouse is some kind of astonishing figure in our history here, because the man must have gotten up at six in the morning and drawn every hour, every hour of the day until he went to bed, because you can't believe the number of drawings that still survive. You know, and it's, when you pick them up, you realize that the, possibly the last person that held this drawing was Waterhouse himself, you know, so it's kind of fabulous, really. All right, the only space of the, and this survives, the only space that has any kind of, I would say, grandeur is um, that, um, that stairwell that goes to the second floor, and that, that's a contemporary photograph. Uh, it's a kind of a modern, modernist interior uh, stair, not, not of great interest. Okay, now we're gonna stop about the building for a little while talk about the architects. And so Carol and Doble were the architects. And uh, I have notes here, I should actually look at them. Okay, so um, they're a great firm, okay? And uh, they formed in 1945. And Ed Carroll was the actual one that thought it up and asked uh, Louis Doble to join him. So together they launched the enterprise in 45. And they would become one of, I've decided that they're one of four, there's Trost, meaning Henry and his descendants, I suppose. Uh, Otto Thorman, Carol and Doble, and Garland and Hillis. That if you think about it, they defined the look of the city for, uh, for 30 or 40 or 50 years. The first three quarters of the 20th century, they defined what it looked like. And what was so wonderful about it all, I think this is Mr. Carroll, that's Mr. Doble, I think. Isn't that right? Those are, that's your dad? I believe so. Oh, well, you should know. Well, he thought that that was third one. He's the third one. Oh, okay. This is uh, this is Waterhouse, though. Okay, so this is a very I don't know where I got that picture. It's quite looks like it's from the 18th century. Okay, so uh, these these folks, um, everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people worked for them. They they were the generators that uh, produced so many other firms. And uh, their legacy of buildings, we'll, we'll look at a few of those, but they produce an amazing amount of stuff. And uh, it seems like Russell Waterhouse, that's Batman's son, told me that if you were anybody in El Paso, if you were any architect in El Paso, you worked with my father and you learned from my father. And uh, I can kind of uh, understand that idea. Okay, here are the uh, cast of characters that uh, uh, I'm, these, there are a lot of people that, at Carol and Doble that designed that building, but these are the ones that really did it. These were the, the principles. Okay, this is Mr. Doble here, and uh, Texas A&M, okay, and um, he has a career in the military. He's from El Paso. Okay, I'm gonna have to return to that thing. I'm gonna say it right now. These, all three of these guys are from El Paso, which you're, if you're an architect of the mid-century, that alone is unusual because so many of the folks that were that would later become prominent here, Garland and Hillis, for instance, they're all from somewhere else. Lots of people came out here to take advantage of the, the opportunity 
these guys were from here, and you kind of have a feeling, of course, that the three men that are from the city grew up here, would have a sense of uh, uh, what, to, what should be done. Okay, so um, Mr. Doble uh, marries uh, Margaret Barron. Is it Le Barron or Barron? Barron. Barron. Okay, I have three kids, one sitting right there. Okay, um, I would say that he must have been a man of the city. I never met him. Uh, a man of the city that had his hands and his ideas in just about everything. And uh, his opinions were uh, obviously appreciated. Uh, you could go on, and somebody should, possibly me, uh, figure out more about him, but, because he's a fabulous character. Okay, he retired in uh, 1973. Okay, uh, last year we talked about, of course, that smiling face. And this is Waterhouse. And this, we won't repeat, since everybody here, I think, except for that lady, was um, there last year. Waterhouse is, is, is an extraordinary. Okay, so we could go on and on. El Pasoan, self-trained, uh, worked for everybody that ever was an architect here. He retired in 1980. Uh, of extraordinary interest is that he was a musician, architect, photographer, and a preservationist. He's worthy of a book, if anybody ever was worthy of a book. Now, intriguingly, he's a friend of Shulman. Okay, so Shulman's the famous international, at least American, photographer. So Shulman uh, flies in to photograph Garland and Hills buildings, uh, Carolyn Dolan buildings, etc. And uh, it's very neat that the two of them were uh, so close. Uh, Russell said, there was some famous photographer that used to drop by and uh, develop pictures in my dad's uh, dark room. And I said, it's, it's Julius Shulman. He said, yeah, that's the man. <laughs> okay, so he's extraordinary, but we've already, we've already kind of lavished him with attention. This is a guy that I didn't really know much about, and uh, now I, this is a new material for me. Uh, Carl Jung, El Pasoan, um, oh, and we need to talk about these ages. Okay, Waterhouse lives to be 97, okay, and uh, Mr. Mr. Doble lives to be 80, okay, and unfortunately, Carl lives to be 61. So at some point in time, when they're making this building, we have Carl, who's 29, Lewis is 40, and uh, Waterhouse is 49. So they're, they're, the, the boss is kind of in the middle. The older man is, the, uh, is an employee of the boss, and Carl is, the, uh, is an extraordinary talent. Okay, so uh, Texas Tech comes to El Paso, comes back to El Paso. He marries uh, Alice Meeting, and she and her son Richard have been incredibly helpful. Uh, he retires from architectural practice in 1959. Now what you need to know is that he's an extraordinary illustrator. And so he's a painter, he does everybody's renderings in the city, probably to a fault, uh, probably shouldn't have done that, probably should focus on his architectural career because he was said to be extraordinarily talented. So uh, we'll have to just uh, wonder about that. So these are the characters um, that uh, come into play because Oh yeah, this is uh, this is uh, Carl Jung's sketch of uh, Russell. I mean, uh, Ewing Waterhouse, which Richard found and sent to me, which I find just fantastic. I never met either of these men, but you know, there's something in the way that that guy is sitting there that suggests he's it could it, that he's he's definitely the person that uh, did all these drawings. Okay, now uh, the the project gets fun for me in that there's a, there's a little tale to tell. El Paso didn't think that Carolyn Doble or anyone was capable of doing a professional library. Okay, so they thought that they had to go outside of the city and find another one. So they chose this guy from New York who famously had finished this Brooklyn library. I'm living in Brooklyn, so I'm not too far from there. Finished that library in 1936. He became something of an expert on how to make efficient libraries. So he came out here. Uh, Tom Lee makes reference to him not very politely, and no one liked him, obviously. He came out here and was trying to bully everyone, I, I'm thinking, into uh, uh, what the building should have been. This is what his idea of a library was. And there, in that room over there in the special collections here, the archive, there must be 50 pages of very frank plans like this, where a library is simply nothing but a shoebox with a bit of decoration on the front, okay? Uh, this is uh, what that, that scheme looked like. See this business here? All this. This is a. This is a. Does anyone know who Robert Venturi is? It's, it's a, Robert, you know who Robert Venturi. 
Okay, if this isn't a decorated shed, I don't know what is. Okay, so here's here's the, here's the, here's the here's the stuff, right? And the actions all um, confined to there. Now, the guy didn't know much about the Southwest because he's proposing something that looks like it might go in uh, Albuquerque or Santa Fe in some sort of period revival tourist trade. Okay, buildings don't look like that here. Okay, so uh, as it evolves, okay, as it evolves. Uh, something does happen because remember I told you that it was the building was divided into three pieces. It begins to to uh, find its shape while he's still on the payroll. Okay, so he's he's come up. This is a slightly more plausible. Looks like a uh, Art Deco dime store. Okay, um, but it's probably a little further along than the other one. Okay, then uh, this is his final his final move towards uh, getting a building done here. And uh, if you know. Architecture. This is a very typical of late 40s, early 50s Cranbrook kind of red brick building. It is symmetrical. The towers. It's a very classical kind of thing. You know, very tiresome, really. Okay, so he's kicked out, and uh, Carol and Doble start producing their stuff, and it's Mr. Doble, and it's uh, Carl Young, and it's Russell Waterhouse, undoubtedly working very intimately to figure out this building. Now, I can't attribute this particular idea to somebody, but uh, it isn't the winner, obviously, but it's very, very interesting because it has, begins to have the, uh, the bands of decoration and motif that becomes uh, this building. Uh, this is a uh, Carl Jung uh, drawing. Now, you have to understand that I'm, I've spent half, most of my life drawing and I teach drawing, and Carl Jung must have popped out of Texas Tech like some kind of genius because he could draw like the wind and probably made a lot of money doing renderings for everybody. Okay, now of extreme significance here is that somebody, that drawing's sitting in a box over there, okay, somebody wrote on this, no bueno. <laughs> <laughs> now is that, is that the greatest thing? Okay, and so in, if you're imagining the scenario, they're struggling with this new building that they're taking charge of, and uh, somebody, they, they've gotten Carl to make this drawing, somebody got excited about making that drawing, and somebody just decided it was not going to look like that. It was going to look like this. Okay, and this is, a, this, is a, this is the kind of drawing, if you're an architectural historian wanting to find how a building gets to be, this is a, this is a, a vein of gold. Okay, this is a Waterhouse sketch. Okay, this uh, shows, you, it, it must have been done, and he must have just said, this is a good idea, let's do it. Okay, so the box, you see the elements are still there, but the box is broken into that zigzag, which you can see in that model. Okay, the pavilions are still in place. That's uh, the children's section, and that's the auditorium. Even the place for the owl is already determined. And the massing study down here shows you exactly, you're, you're right in the head of, uh, of, of, of an architect. And I just realized right now that that, 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 that writing is, of course, exactly the same hand that did that. So I say he probably uh, overrode everybody else on the deal. Okay, these gorgeous drawings. Uh, Russell was going to come today, but he was here in the city earlier, so I FedExed him these pictures, and he got them yesterday. And I said, I want you to tell me, is it Carl Jung or is it your dad that did these drawings? And he said, my dad did these drawings. And I said, how can you be so sure? And he said, Carl Jung would not do a scale figure that looks like that. <laughs> and there's a, if you look at a lot of Waterhouse drawings, you, you, you see the hand. But what's rather fabulous is that kind of like in a, in a bold moment, the whole, thing, the whole thing came to be as we know it. Now, this is a Carl Jung drawing. He's uh, developing it as probably a rendering. This is a Carl Jung tree here. But the thing did not get developed much after that. So, after all of that churning, all of that anxiety of making the wrong building, they made the right, the right building in probably five hours, and then it became to be what it is. Um, this is a, a Waterhouse drawing of the famous freeze. Okay, that, that drawing, one of those drawings is sitting in that case, so that's extraordinary that we still have this. It's true scale, meaning the fascia is about this big and that drawing is about that big. So he worked at the scale of the building, which is, uh, is, is remarkable. I forgot to say something about this, and you're going to pull the plug on me. It's just, I, I feel it coming. Okay, the the, the detailing. Okay, see the, this this limestone, this this beautiful stone. All of the edges are rounded. Okay, so it would give this extremely soft quality to the building. A modernist would just make it hard edged and go on with it. 
and the softness in our light, I'm positive is uh, why it's so uh, gorgeous, because you always get this condition of the edge not quite being in the sun or the shadow. It's fantastic. Okay, uh, for another scholar, maybe me or somebody, this is a, this, after they got that sketch going, uh, somebody sat down and uh, made this drawing. And this drawing is the precursor of the absolute final building. And all of the elements are in place. I think it's a little shorter than it, than it probably ended up being, but it's, it's a neat find. Okay, and the uh, last thing to say about the building and the irony that I just figured out last night, okay, is that um, this is a, arguably, this is the most famous thing about this building, is it not? The, the mural and these, these, these leaf bounds, right? And uh, I'm kind of like, I've always been on the fence about whether I like them or not. Okay, and then I'm looking closely at the library. Okay, so this is the Brooklyn Library. And of course, it's famous for exactly the same thing. The two columns uh, carry all of these uh, mythological, see this is, uh, this is uh, the, the, what, fifth century BC, and this is the uh, second century BC. These mythological characters are all over this building. So what, you're, uh, what, you would, what he must have thought, Gibbons, that's the architect, he must have thought, well, that's very ironic. They've kicked out all of my ideas except for one, and that is that they used all of these uh, symbols. Okay, we're gonna we're moving towards closure here. Okay, we got it. We got it. At least understand that this is not a totally unique building, meaning that it didn't was not hatched out of uh, out of the imagination of anybody. Obviously, it was not. Okay, so this clearly has something. The absence of windows to me is really really characteristic, and the absence of windows and the sort of uh, projecting roof line is good. This is uh, something we showed last year, which is a water house sketch. He sketched constantly when he was self-training himself. And uh, he loved Spanish colonial architecture and knew how to make a silhouette on a building. That's how, I, that's how it should be said. Okay, the massiveness. We have to show this picture every time we do a show. The massive heaviness of that. This is the mother of El Paso architecture, this building. Really. Okay, but it's also characteristic of lots of other trove stuff. Big, massive overhangs big, massive uh, sun control devices. You, you, these guys could not have uh, uh, been unaware of that. Interestingly, okay, um, for all of us that are thinking geneal genealogically, we have uh, Bob Garland, David Hillis, Carl Jung, and Waterhouse, our buddies, drinking buddies. You know, there's lots of pictures of them and everything. They all knew each other. Uh, Ella Hillis, came to El Paso to do a house for his sister, okay? And this house, uh, I think, I'm, I'm gonna say this, although I can't really prove it. It's the first time, I think, that this vernacular stone work, okay, was used in a high-style building. Of course, we all grew up with yard walls made out of that stuff, but, and it was seen as, you know, a, like a substandard product, probably. But Hills didn't see it that way, so he um, produced, uh, that's what the inside of that house looks like these beautiful walls of stone, they had to all know about it. This was 1953, okay? Waterhouses, they're, they're talking about it. Uh, they're very aware of uh, their- Where is that now? It's on McKelligan. I was just there. Uh, some, somebody has bought it with the conviction of McKelligan. spending a lot of money on it and, and tearing down the mistakes that were littered the back, I shall we say. Okay, now uh, you can't look at any building in the Southwest that's got stone as prominent as our building without thinking about this mother of many Southwestern buildings, which is Taliesin. Okay, so Frank Lake Wright did this in 37. The, these large stone walls are, are remarkable. Okay, around the region, we have people that are uh, sick of modernism. Okay, sick of buildings that look like department stores or train stations and stuff. And you have, uh, this is, I, I think that the, our building here is extremely important in that tradition because it is not a fake Pueblo. It's nothing like that, okay? It's not, it's not an, an imitation of some fantasy of a colonial building. It's definitely a modern building, but it's got the feel and the, the touch of a, of a regional building. It's fantastic. So O'Neill Ford is beginning to do, no, he did this in 36, but he builds a career doing buildings that are modernist, but they are accessible, okay? And uh, we've looked at this before. The whole time frame of this, this is 46. 
These are 38 and 47. These are Belutsky in the, the Northwest. Uh, the whole era is losing interest in extreme modernism and looking for regional interest. Somebody was, uh, Melissa and I were talking about this. This is how, uh, this does not look like any building around here, obviously. Uh, you drive through the Oregon landscape, lots of buildings look like that, barns particularly. Okay, so he's, he's evoking a certain shape and then using a motif borrowed from agriculture, which is that you put up these brick walls with these uh, popped out holes in it for ventilation. Okay, our, our building is, has, has got a lot of that same feel. Okay, you have uh, William Worcester, 56. This is a couple years after our building. Okay, Worcester is, becomes the, uh, the dean of architecture at, um, at Berkeley and is uh, done with modernism himself in the manner that we've been uh, ridiculing. That is in uh, Modesto. I think it's a. I think it's a really. I don't know about that roof, but it's, I've seen that house, and I don't remember the roof being that extreme. But it's uh, it's his take on. It looks like it should be on a Texas military establishment, really. But it's his take on this long, uh, continuous porch as a, pro a proper place to live. Okay. Finally, I'm moving to the finish. Okay. These guys. We're going back to Carolyn Double. Okay, their works during this period are, are uh, of remarkable quality. We all know that building. Okay, and uh, I believe that's Mr. Carroll's baby, but I'm not positive. I think uh, Carl Young worked on that building, but Mr. Carroll was busy with this when uh, uh, Mr. Doble was busy with the library. Very similar time. Okay, this is a Julius Schulman photograph that got national coverage. Okay, that's one good looking school. And uh, the way it sits there, regrettably torn down. Uh, Schulman loved that building and uh, produced great pictures of it. Okay, uh, this is, um, we all know this building. Do you go to this church, Betty? Yeah. Betty, are you a First no, Presbyterian? No. Okay, I grew up in this church. So uh, this is a Carl Young rendering of that building. And, um, and Conway did the stained glass. Thing. Yes, he did, right. On the front. Okay, so it has, I think it's a knockout in terms of uh, quality. And I think that you, you can't, no one can, contradict me on this one. What was learned in the library is applied in this thing. These, these columns as fins, okay, the low ceiling, they got kind of clever and detached the top of the column from the soffit, which I think is a good idea. Okay, it's just, look at it, it's just incredibly good looking. And um, I told, I, I'm, I lived with this building for my childhood, and, I, and the Garland and Hills House that's right above it, they influenced me, they influenced everybody. Okay, we all know the interior. It's made like a battleship. Okay, I was just there with the uh, uh, with the, the priest, the, the pastor. The pastor. That, I, I wondered if you were going to show up. Thank you for showing up. Tell us who you are again. Neil Locke. That's right. Okay, cool. You don't look as august today in your ball cap. You look <laughs> far more august than you did the other day. <laughs> anyway, so he's burdened with this uh, very, very massive, expensively built. Uh, we were chatting about it. The uh, you know it's built like it's built to the same standard that the El Paso Natural Gas Company built with the building is no built no church is built like that anymore. So the whole burden of history is that if you're going to inherit an, an astonishingly expensive building, did I tell you that the library was nine hundred seventy five thousand dollars? <laughs> is that cool? It's definitely me. This this one isn't. Uh, this is less than two million dollars. I think it's the the amount of money spent. I guess that's a lot of money, but. Uh, so um, these are our Tom Lee those are, directed. No, those are Tom Lee, the front one. I think just the front. The, you the, mean the, up in the, under, by the, the cross? Front, the front yeah. cross, the was, cross. Uh, was based on a Tom Lee painting. I don't know which one. He designed it. He designed it for it. He was, uh, he was on the uh, committee for the building. Um, was he? But, but the actual, the, I, it's the, the person who did the stained glass a, a different person, but it was inspired by his direction, his influence. Okay. And, and I don't know Bill, if he Bill designed Burroughs the windows. The windows too. With Bill on Burroughs. the side too, were those done by the Tom? Uh, he was on the committee that, like. But you, know, you can imagine Burroughs, Tom Lee, and uh, Doble being very, very close on how to make this building and how to what they wanted, how to make the building the way that they wanted. And uh, yeah, I. They're, they're quite unusual, really. And now, and from 50 years later, they're really extraordinary to my mind. Okay, um, this is, uh, I don't know if you all know this building, the Lee Moore home. They did 
dozens of buildings that are good. These just catch my eye because they remind me of the library. And they uh, also suggest, this is Lee Moore, it's a children's home, got it. Okay, uh, Waterhouse's um, uh, hands are all over it, meaning that he's such a good guy when it comes to uh, organizing mass. All of that, I love the building, it's really pretty, very well made. Okay, this connects, we talked about this building last year, but if you look at those kind of details, then you realize that this building, the uh, Lake Homer House, is, uh, uh, he's, he was learning how to do all that stuff. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna propose that, and it's no ch surprise to any of you guys, you can't go around and see a new building that doesn't owe something to the library. And uh, this is a neat building by uh, Miharis Mora, and uh, this is in Sila Vista, but these columns and all of that, he told me that that's what they were thinking about, so it's not a surprise there. Okay, uh, this is the back of it, it's a terrible picture. Uh, this beautiful little uh, library in um, David Alpedris, did in Memorial Park, I think has something to do with it. And let's, I'm afraid to show the next one. <laughs> what we're saying, I'm terribly afraid to show <laughs> what we're saying, but we're all, you all know me, so this is hardly a bunch of strangers. Okay, I'm saying that growing up here and knowing these buildings influences you, me. Okay, and the only building I think, oh, there's another one here, thank God. This is the uh, aquatic uh, center across the way from the library, which is really neat. And here's this building that I did in Dax. Okay, and I say that this stuff, okay, that the elements, that little fascia piece right there and these floating elements um, uh, are uh, my homage to El Paso. Now you should know that um, um, Garland, I told Garland that, and he said, he looked at the picture, he said, I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is that building? It's a, it's a nightclub, the restaurant and nightclub. So it was great fun, but I, I, this, the, I'm, I'm still holding on this, that, that cantilever and those, oh yes, by the way, these um, columns that are walls are definitely are part of that. Okay, so there we go. And uh, if you don't have, everyone in here I think has my email address, even more. Okay, but if you, if you need more information, um, email me and I'll give you everything you need to know. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill. And um, before I go ahead, I do want to say a, a lot of what I was able to pull together um, in the past when I was making this presentation came from Bill. So thank you very much and thank you very much, Adair. Um, and thank you, Bill, for kind of telling me, yes, you'll be on the panel. Because he kept asking me, well, who could, you? when you first asked me to be on the panel, you, you, I, I wasn't very clear. But then you said, no, 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 it's you. And so here I am. But in Welcome. any case. <laughs> Welcome to the tradition. <laughs> um, I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, but one thing that we have touched upon was that this is sort of a, a departure from modernism. because. Um, in this building, we find so many pieces of our own regional identity. And uh, one thing about modernism is it, it's very stark and you know it has this sort of lack of decorative design. But in redesigning the new building, um, which uh, Bill was able to talk about, we do see these um, elements um, that are embedded in the library and also um, pieces that were designed specifically. Um, we've seen this before. And you know, here's sort of some examples that I pulled up where you do have these interesting shapes that come together. But you know, uh, for example, um, the lower right hand side—that's a JFK, um, that's a, a JFK um, airport in New York City. You know, what what does that say about the region? You know, nothing. And um, so when you have a building like this that starts picking up on uh, what makes El Paso and who are the regional, uh, the, who are the communities and what is the culture that contributed um, to, you know, what we know today um, in our art and in our culture and being able to put that in a modern design, um, you know, it was a huge departure. We saw this picture earlier and this is the, uh, these are, these uh, are images that were actually taken from Waco tanks and something I found out from the dare was that Ewing Waterhouse not only was, you know, um, you know, a fastidious draftsman and did all these drawings, but he was also very much an uh, anthropologist, and he actually went out to Waco tanks and was able to find these um, images out there. And he, you know, 
put them on the ceiling here, and it's it's a story. It's a it's a story. And one thing you might talk about in um, in putting K drawings on the portico. So as you enter um, the building, there the building immediately has a relationship with the viewer because you're looking at at hieroglyphs. And what are hieroglyphs? But they're the first recorded language of man. And the information that is provided there is preserved for the future, and that's what a library is. And um, it is the recorded uh, history of the region, because these, uh, these images came from Waco tanks and um, the Native American community that's you know, it, embedded in this heritage. Um, and the art of a building is completely indispensable um, because it, act, it acts as both pleasure and it's functional because it's able to express the function of the library of the building. Um, we saw these designs before, and I want you, uh, I'd like you to notice, for example, the mountain sheep and the chief, and um, how do you get the, or where's the actual, is that it? Yeah, and the mom, the chief, and the mountain sheep. You know, I was able to find direct examples of, um, so here you see these sort of uh, mountain goats. The, the culture that contributed most probably to the ornamental design of the library with the, the Jordana um, Mongolan, who um, you know, were from 3000 BC to 450 AD. They were in that region before the Mescalo or Apache came in. And um, you see this zigzag motif. Well, that was, that's actually found out there. And that's even um, in indigenous culture before um, the Jordana Mongolan um, that lived lived out at Waco Tanks and took shelter there. And you see that zigzag motif not only on the outside, but on inside ornamental features. Um, there's a rain calendar that is based off of these, uh, uh, the step fret and step wedge. And it, it represented, you know, the cycles of the earth and the sun and the rain and things like that. And this was, this is a Mesoamerican god. And um, you know, as the American Mesoamerican tribes moved upward and lived in Waco tanks, you had this emergence of culture, and you know, um, they took on the Mesoamerican religions, um, focusing on Quetzalcoatl. And then again, you know, you have um, you see the oops, put it back. The you know the turtle here, and again, these little figures here that you do see, and then this mask is a chief. Now, something I found out about Waco Tanks, it has the largest collection of masks, mask impressions, um, pictographs in the world. Um, and you know, you, you, you find that they uh, are very important in, in sort of that regional culture. And so what Waterhouse did was he took um, real pictographs and uh, uh, created a petroglyph. Um, so that's you know an impression that's embedded into the soffit of that portico, and it actually tells a story. Um, the the story is that um, first you and you, you can't see the edges of this, but first you have sort of the creation of man, and you have birds that uh, you know sort of flow in, and and then you have uh, where it starts really is the. Um, the cultures that, the other cultures that um, are important to our Southwest, which is, would have been the Europeans on horseback. And so these are Europeans on horseback, and these are images that are found out at Waco Tanks. And you see that the, you know, sort of an Indian coming in, and he's watching over these uh, figures that are sort of invading, and then you see um, Indian uh, warriors who are blocking them from coming towards the chief. And it's the same on both sides. So when you look at it, you know, you can either come in from the left or you can come in, come in from the left or come in from the right and then, you know, arrive at this uh, story. And then um, here are these uh, rain calendars that are, um, you know, sort of all over with the tanks. And um, sort of this is what they're colored in, but these are what these impressions uh, look like now outside the library. And you can, when you go out, if you go out through the, the old section of the library, you can, you can see that. And um, then you have the inside of the library. And uh, again, I, I, that brochure was done by Carl Herzog, which, which was a friend of Tom Lee's. And 
Um, the other first, the other people who did work on this, um, that would have been Jose Cisneros, uh, did all these uh, wood carvings for the end of the bookshelves. He did 24, or for the 24 bookshelves that, that went around the library. And then um, also Stan Steffen, and he did the period furniture, and he included that zigzag motif as well. And so, uh, and of course, Tom Lee, who did the owl, um, who since ancient times was a, uh, a symbol of uh, intelligence, and then he did the, uh, the mural, mural. And then here's the image that we saw before, so I won't, um, but it, is, it was done in the traditional Spanish way, so it's made out of pine, and there are no nails and no screws, which I thought was very interesting. And then um, these, these figures here, uh, these wood carvings by Jose Cisneros. Oh no, that's not the slide that I saved a while. Um, uh, you can actually go to the library and you can pull out the, the wood carvings that they still kept from Jose Cisneros. And um, this is the, the Spanish um, uh, coat of arms, the Mexican seal, and that's a llama. And I'm not quite sure how that represents our culture, but sure. it's in the mountains. Um, and then, um, of course, he has these designs that, that Ewing Water, Waterhouse uh, asked him to make, and those also decorated um, the bookshelves going around. And then Urbici Soler, who was a sculptor who created Mount Cristo Rey, he um, did these, uh, this is out of wood, I think this is wood and this is bronze cast, and these are two Native American women. This is the, uh, you know, I'm not going to say, it's out of canyon. Uh, Fresilla, and that's in the hard, uh, hardwood, and this is, uh, and then on the right is Mater Dolorosa, and um, these are Mesoamerican women, you know, people who would have uh, lived in this region. Um, I also had a, a different slide, but one thing that I did want uh, to talk about was that this library, in, in essence, is unique um, because it, in you know. It departed from what modernism did, and you, it was decorated in a, a way that had a reflection, a reflexive relationship with anybody coming in. And anybody coming in, it was essentially greeted with the oldest type of uh, recorded uh, writing and history that um, you know man has. And then you went in, and you were experiencing all of the cultures that led up to what makes El Paso, from um, you know the 3000 BC, um, you know, all the way through the Spanish and, and the Mexican cultures that came in through El Paso. And then you have these El Paso ar architects who did, did their research, and you have the El Paso art artists, Jose Cisneros, um, Urbici Soler, and um, Stan Stefan, who did their research and really took, you know, what things that we can identify and things that we immediately recognize because we've seen them in the museums and we've seen them when we go out to Waco Takes and, you know, and, and, you know, put that all of that in um, a place where you could potentially study it in the Southwest Reading Room or in in the Latin American collection. And in any case, I don't want to uh, go on for too long, but I uh, that's that's what um, was impressed upon me, and I found it amazing to find that he took he went out and and took these uh, real life Im um, images from thousands of years ago and, and brought that to the library here. And in any case, um. <laughs> but you know, if what you were saying yesterday, don't forget to talk about the idea that you see at Wake Up Tanks, you actually see a lot of Oh, that. that's right. And, and the thing is too, is you know, that, that, that portico, that portal, um, uh, Bill talked about how there would have been markets and things like that, but you go into the portico and it's that shelter for you. You go to Waco Tanks and you go into shelter and, and above you are these images. And so, you know, there's there's a relationship and there's an identity there that's replicated in this, uh, you know, very modern, this modern building, but it's a south, southwest. It's it's indicative, indicative of the culture here that we find here in El Paso. So uh, that's, that's the other thing that I was talking about. But in any case, thank you very much for... Um, listening. Thank you very much for being here today. And I hope you can. Is there anything else you would like to add, Bill or Adair? So we have things to learn from the past? <laughs> you know, you know, you know um, preserving, please preserve our heritage and history and our, our buildings. Um, our buildings communicate so much about our history. 
And this is something, uh, uh, Adair mentioned, I, I started the Trade Society, and that's because some of our history is coming down. These buildings were, are, you know, were so well made, their bones are so strong, they could last forever. They're here for the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and when you take them down, you've just taken a piece of, a, a piece of our regional identity, a piece of our regional culture away. And, and it's something that you just cannot get back. And, and people don't build this way anymore. And they, they, you do have these, uh, you know, these influences, but people can't build this way anymore um, it, it, when it comes to a lot of the trust buildings, but in this, in this uh, sense as well. And so um, the, the function and design of a building to communicate what the building represents to the community is something that is so important. It's something that's to be admired and respected. In, in the library itself. And it's something that, you know, deserves a second look if you haven't taken it already. So. You know, Stan Stoven ended up doing the frames for Tom Hanks. He said he would adjust them all to speak the subject. I keep saying that El Paso is a small world, but it was a small world back then, too. But mm -hmm. he did their frames, and a lot of people have taken them off because they've changed style. They want to be plastic or this or that, but there's something you want to hold on to. I think the Urbici Solaire came in. I don't know when those came. Well, actually, Carl Herzog cites those sculptures oh, yeah? Really? Mm -hmm. yep. so in 1956, were. so they were here. Oh, and so it would have, it, um, Urbici Solar, uh, I think, passed away before the, the building was finished, but, but, the, they, were but they were here um, and when it was inaugurated. And, um, and so They're you have... Wonderful. You know, you know, another person, no one knows. No. Right. Um, in any case, so any, anything else, Bill or Adair, that you'd like to add to that? I try to go as quickly as possible. <laughs> Any case, well, thank you again. And if you uh, make sure to turn in your survey at the end because we really need those to write grants if you haven't done that already. But thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you And during our last week of Tom Lee Month. This is the last week, so I hope to see you again. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your, of your Saturday. <laughs>